I met Jesper Rosenmeier about 30 years ago when I first came to Tufts where he was a prominent figure and I was very much a new boy and to my delight a few months ago he fetched up an Anasquam <laughs> and I think we've captured him as a permanent winter resident. Yeah. I really hope so. Yeah. Jesper, Jesper is a Dane by birth, but he left Denmark after his first year at university in Copenhagen and came to the United States and took his undergraduate degree at Princeton and then went to Harvard for a PhD in the history of American civilization. And he has spent most of his distinguished career at Tufts, and he now is the Fletcher Professor of English Emeritus, but again teaching this semester, braving the traffic of Route 128 <laughs> uh, to uh, teach a seminar after some years in retirement. Uh, Jesper is published widely in professional journals, written two books, and has a long list of workshops and conferences in which he has participated or conducted. He is well known and admired in his field. His specialty is early American literature prior to the 1830s, and I think this is particularly appropriate to our concerns, because that time found the physical character of our village already well formed, and the material remnants are still very much with us. We are aesthetically comfortable with them, if not with their lack of amenities, which we now take for granted. But what, what about their intellectual world, we might well ask? What did our forebears think? What ideas were important to them? Are they relevant to our concerns? <clears throat> Presumably, Puritanism suffused their minds. That word carries a certain pejorative uh, flavor today, but are, are we being fair when we apply that interpretation to these people of the past? I think it's splendid that Jesper has chosen this subject with which to enlighten us. Why Anasquam is his title. What I have learned from the Puritans. And this, I think, promises to enrich our understanding of why we are what we are. Jesper, thanks for coming and doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you for that welcome. And uh, it is uh, an astonishing generosity I have met uh, in the uh, four months I have been here. I had heard that Gloucester had a great sense of community. Can you hear what I'm saying? No, please speak up a little bit more. It's, okay. There are lots of us here. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right, good. Uh, just give me the sign. <laughs> uh, uh, and you, you have just, you just been extraordinarily welcome to me. I just hadn't expected it. I had expected that it would be uh, the ocean and my dog and, I. <laughs> <laughs> and instead you have did not just welcomed me, uh, but you have in the most generous way invited me uh, to share in the life of Anisquam. And I am so delighted to be here. And it is already beginning to feel a little like a homecoming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, when John, when John asked me to talk about the Puritans, I didn't quite know know how to go about it because I'm used to having either an academic conference mask when I talk about the Puritans, <laughs> or my teacher mask when I talk about it to my students. But I hadn't really talked to an audience like this about them before. And so John also said that there were, might be a discussion after, after my talk. And so I decided that I would talk very personally about how I got into the field 
and what it has meant for me to work in the Puritan vineyard for 50 years. Um, so tonight I'm putting down my academic mask and my teacher mask and I'm putting on the mask of no mask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, came, I came here in part because I wanted to return to the ocean. Uh, being from Denmark, it's very hard not to uh, live on the water. And for me it was a childhood gift of freedom and wholeness uh, to be by the ocean, particularly uh, on the west coast of Jutland, out uh, by the North Sea. And I wanted to go back to that early wholeness and that early freedom. And I have certainly found that here. And so too do the marshes, of these wonderful marshes that you, we have here. Uh, I don't have rocks, we don't have rocks in Denmark and, the, and Anisquam doesn't have any heather or, <laughs> or blooming heather or heath, but uh, it has the beach grass, it has the sand on the dunes, it has the light that gets caught and held by the waves before they break, and the light that splinters in the beach grass. It is very much a great pleasure for me to be back with that landscape and to be in it now that it looks as if, but it's not entirely certain that I have lived longer than I am going to live. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then of course there is this, uh, I have over the years I've come up to Crane's Beach in Plum Island a great deal and often driven around here because it is, as John said, a place that is so suffused with history. Uh, there's something about all these early houses. Simon Weil, the uh, French mystic, says in a wonderful book called uh, The Need for Roots, she says we can't do anything more important for our communities and our culture than preserving the old houses. And so people talk about, some people talk about, say about the shake of chairs, the big ones, that they are an invitation for an angel to sit. <laughs> uh, I love that. And in some ways, there is a luminosity to these early houses here that goes beyond just light and become an invitation to something else. And then, of course, I was very pleased to find that there is a Danish connection to Cape Ann, namely that, though I sort of wish that that we had kept the name that John Smith gave it, Trevi Gazanda, in honor of his Turkish mistress. <laughs> so by now, probably that Muslim influence would have been erased from the landscape. <laughs> but it, that didn't suit uh, King Charles uh, I, and he decided to rename it after his mother, uh, who was the daughter of the Danish king and married King James of Scotland in 1589. That's not very important, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in 1589, and so uh, they called the Cape. Uh, we uh, named the Cape Ann, though her name was spelled with a an E. And there's a wonderful story, wonderful and, and horrible story about the wedding. That a few weeks before they were, they James and Anne were married, a group of people came from a small town southwest of Copenhagen, and said that they had found all the records of a monastery going back to the 11th century up through the Reformation in 1536. So 400 years of complete records uh, that unparalleled in European history, even more a fold than the, the one at Cluny. Well, said the king, that's great because my daughter's getting married and I need it, I can use this vellum for fireworks. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they took the gunpowder and, and wrapped it in the vellum and so there went the there went the monks' records over Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> history, history, history. So it's a daily delight for me to be driving around here in the simplicity and the elegance and the luminosity. And this delight goes hand in hand with what I have chosen to, or what I chose to make my life's labor, namely the Puritans. And as John said, uh, there's a pejorative tinge to that, I think. And why, why would I want to do that? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Puritans are so encrusted in stereotypes. And it's very, very hard to get at who they are. 
bit like all stereotypes, there is a kernel of truth to it. And the facts are <laughs> obvious. Yes, they killed the witches in Salem, the court, court witches, though they may have practiced witchcraft, but that's another, for another time. They hanged the Quakers on the Boston Common. They banished Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, whom we now think of as really the heroic people at that time. And most of all, and still haunting, they murdered, burned and murdered hundreds of Native people in Mystic, Connecticut during the Pequot War. I mean, you, you have to have a screw loose in order to, <laughs> to want to work and devote your life to studying those people. <laughs> and not only that, but if, then if you are a lover of literature, you find that you have to spend a lot of your time reading sermons, and the sermons lie on the page like desiccated skeletons. <laughs> and a lot of it, I, mean, I don't know whether you remember from your college days, the famous tulip, uh, uh, that God has uh, uh, total control. There's uh, limited salvation. Only about 10% of the people were considered uh, to go to heaven. The other 90% would go elsewhere. <laughs> there was a... Uh, uh, and then there was a chestnut of chestnuts, infant damnation. I mean, why, why, would, you, why would you want to do that? Uh, maybe you not just have to have a screw loose, but you have to be unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did I get into that field? I got into it because uh, I had in, in graduate school uh, a very charismatic teacher whose name was Perry Miller, whom some of you work with and others of you know. And uh, I was asked to be a teaching fellow in his course on early American literature, the famous English Seven and I was hooked. Miller had a, a combination of, he was probably the 20th century most brilliant American historian. And he had a tremendous passion for his work. And a wit, and a gift with words where he could just conjure up worlds. I remember when I, I since I was supposed to be teaching the sections, I would take notes, so I would start to listening to him taking notes, and then after a while I would put down my pen because I was simply like it was like sunshine going into my bone and, and marrows. I just gave it, gave up taking notes and just listened because I was being nourished in a way that was so extraordinary. And then afterwards, when we were talking about it, I said, "Wasn't that a great lecture?" And they said, "Yes." And then somebody would say, what did you think he, he talked about? I said, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if you have had that experience with great orators, you know, that they, I've, I've known three. I've known three in my life that won't go into the other two. But this quality again, that you listen to them and you know that you've been giving something, it's like sunshine itself, and you can't remember what it was that they said. And he was, in spite of the, the brilliant of his mind, he was, he loved to quote Melville, uh, Melville writing to Hawthorne when Hawthorne was consul in, uh, in England in the 1850s. And oh, uh, Melville wrote to him, said, uh, wrote to, and said to Hawthorne, to the dogs with the head, I want to live from the heart. <laughs> so, and that was, that was Miller, and I think it was that combination of heart and mind <coughs> that so compelled me, and I saw what it meant to really devote oneself to a calling. So I wanted to work with him. And he was also, he reminded me of my father, uh, who had the same, he was also very brilliant <laughs> and a very gifted speaker. When he would come down in the morning, he could really recreate the world for us at the breakfast table. It was spellbinding. And, uh, the one Copenhagen newspaper called my dad the, the best teacher in Denmark. And that was just the beginning of what might have been. But like Miller, uh, the two of them, the two of them really went across boundaries that the rest of us more or less stay inside. And their passions and their cravings, their appetites drove them across those lines. And into self-destruction, they took different forms, and I don't need to go into them here. 
But we, the seminars that I took from him, we would meet in his house, and he had on the wall a print of Picasso's, Picasso's Seder, where one half of the face is in light and the other half of the face is in darkness. And I thought how much that fitted him. So then when I uh, finished my all exams, I went to him and said I would like to write uh, on sa sacramental rhetoric in the Reformation. And he looked at me and he said, fine, you're going to be wandering in that wilderness for 25 years, but I'll give you as much rope as you want to hang yourself with. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'd like that. <laughs> So I sat down and I began with what was then the first 55 volume, volumes of Luther's <laughs> writings. <laughs> and I, and I had a great time. And he was wonderful, <laughs> wonderfully supportive of what I was doing and also helped me in all kinds of ways with grants and fellowships and recommendations and, <coughs> and working for him. And uh, give me a one, one great moment as a, as a teacher. I, one of the chapters I wrote on Calvin and gave it to him and it was with some fear and trembling because I had really shown that he was at least half wrong in his book on Dr. Williams. <laughs> uh, there it was. And a couple of weeks later there was that gruff, wonderful voice on the telephone and the first thing he said, he didn't say who he was, he said, sorry I was wrong, was I? <laughs> Which becomes a great moment for to have as a teacher giving you that moment because then you know that you can do that with your students uh, as I have had ample opportunity to do. <laughs> <laughs> so Miller died uh, again in response to the Kennedy assassination in November of 63. And I then went to the chair of the history of American civilization. I love that, the history of American civilization. Both its ponderousness and its, <laughs> and its anxiety. <laughs> Last year, Harvard changed it to American studies. <laughs> I, I wish that kept it the way I wish we kept Trump Gazanda. But I, so I said to the chair, I need a new uh, advisor. And he said, yes, you do. And he said, you have to write about something American. You can't do this European stuff. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but, but Mr. Miller said I could. And he said, yeah, but he's dead. <laughs> so I had to write another thesis. And I think it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I think I might be sit sitting in a very threadbare coat in, in Widener having arrived at the post-reformation. Post <laughs> But that was a major reason for my getting into the field. But then as the years went by, I realized that there were other and deeper reasons for doing so, namely that I had a need for roots in this country. I originally came just to be here for one year to go to college, and here I am 60 years later. Uh, and uh, uh, I, at that point, there was no interest really in Native American. Uh, studies at all. And I then turned to those pale northern Protestant Europeans because they were the closest thing I could come to a spiritual ancestors in this country. And I, I want to really jump into what I take and what I took and still take from the Puritans. And the best way to go about it is just to tell you a little bit there about a book that was take a very short thing from a book that was written by a professor at Columbia called, his name was Edmund Leitis, L-E-I-T-S, and his book was called uh, Puritan Sexuality, uh, um, uh, Puritan Conscience and Modern Sexuality. And he lays out six characteristics. And he says about the most important is, and I think this may come as a surprise to you, he says that the Puritans wanted to live their lives in the service of Eros. Mm. which seeks to unite the hearts and minds of people because Eros aims at a spiritual and mental unity, not simply at the establishment of collectivities united by civility and individual restraint. Though there is a sense that there is a life that people can share with each other, and it is that integrative ideal. If you go to the dictionary for the definition of Eros, it's just that. Mm. The integration of heart and mind. Mm. Mm. So deeply erotic. 
And it's a, when you then, so th then you say, why was it that they went there? They went there because England at the time was going through enormous suffering as it was changing from a medieval uh, feudal society to a, a pre-capitalist, pre-modern one. Enormous sufferings. I spent many months working in Lincolnshire, in Boston, England, trying to understand who the people were who came here <coughs> and why it was that they hated each other so much <coughs> over there. <laughs> I mean, the, the, not just the Puritans, but the Puritans and the non-Puritans. Uh, and I think when people are in those kinds of, when, when individuals and cultures are caught in that kind of pain and suffering, they experience it as a death. And what the Puritans kept saying to themselves was, we must die, but die into life. That is, if you're in that society, you're part of that society, and there's nothing you can do about it. The question is, are you going to deny the death you're in, or are you going to accept it and find a process to move out of it? So it becomes a matter of surrendering of the old self in the interest of finding a new one. That's why it's deeply erotic, that is, life-affirming. Then when you go to the sermons themselves, it's absolutely surprising because the closest thing they can come to to talking about what that, what that union with the divine or that going to those wellsprings of love is se sexual uh, union. So much contrary to what you heard about the Puritans as repressed sex sexual hypocrites, uh, the, their sermons are full of explicit sexual metaphors. Mm. So I called my, I stole a title from one of the sermons from my book, and I called it "Spiritual Concupiscence." <laughs> That's a quote from the title. I think a minister saying to his congregation, "You must be full of spiritual lust," and I mean lust. I thought of calling my book "Amorous for Christ," which would have improved the sales a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Um, uh, so, but there is a. I was uh, very surprised last fall to come across um, an article, I don't know whether you read it, but it's called Journals and it's a Flannery O'Connor's journal, uh, the article is called My Dear God. And she talks about this in a way that could come out of a Puritan man marriage manual or from a Puritan sermon. And I want to read it to you. It's a little hard to take in, so can you hear me okay now? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Divine love which my, while it too may be desire, is a different kind of desire. So you really have to get at, if, if you want to get to those wellsprings of love, you have to say that the desire has to be as great or greater than physical desire is. Mm -hmm. Divine love, which while it too may be desire, is a different kind of desire, divine desire, and is outside a man and capable of lifting him up to itself. Man's desire for God is bedded in his unconscious and seeks to satisfy itself in physical possession of another human. This necessarily is a passing, fading attachment in its sensuous aspects. Can you follow me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Since it is a pure substitute <coughs> for what the unconscious is after. The more conscious the desire for God becomes, the more successful union with another becomes because the intelligence realizes the relation in its relation to a greater desire, and if this intelligence is in both parties, the motive power in the desire for God becomes double and gains in becoming godlike. That is, God dwells in you. So the purity. Yeah? yeah? Okay. <laughs> the modern man, isolated from faith, from raising his desire for God into a conscious desire, is sunk into the position of seeing physical love as an end in itself. That's Flannery O'Connor, and that's from the fall of 2013, and I tell you, if you gave it to me, I would say, hmm, that sounds like 1630. <laughs> so, what? <Yeah>. Throwback. <laughs> yeah. Throwback. <laughs> so then the question becomes, what happened to that? And the, the thing is, and here I think we, you begin to get, if you imagine that picture of the Seder in Miller's study, also being true of the face of the Puritan. Then you get, then this is what Leidus says, that although the Puritans sought a new conception of sexuality as a steady and active force 
by asking their consciences to help put their sexuality to good and loving use, their emotions could not sustain the demands they imposed on themselves and others for inward and outward purity. Now, the last 40 years has shown us what happens when people's insistence on, all over the world, um, insistence on spiritual purity and there's not enough love to fill it, then the conscience will demand it and the conscience will not care about other human beings. They are to be expended in the service of you or in order for the purity to be maintained. And so you begin to see the whole face coming together, don't you? That you can have both halves of it. So, uh, this, I'm going to change gears a little bit. This integrative erotic vision has its own language, which the Puritans call the language of Canaan, the language of the promised land. And I need to, I want to talk about that and what that has meant to me. But before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit what it's like being an immigrant coming into English. Uh, I cannot hear as I'm talking to you that I have an accent. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> But if I play it into a tape recorder, I can hear it very clearly. Oh, yeah. And then I begin to think I should do what the movie stars do, go to a speech therapist and have <laughs> that Danish flatness eradicated. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I mean, I thought about it. <laughs> and I said, it's like scars. You really, there's the historical record, what's and all, and I'll, I'll keep it. But not only do I have an accent, so I set myself apart. I can't open my mouth without setting myself apart. So <laughs> when I begin to talk tonight, there's a moment where I have to say, you're going to open your mouth, they're going to know you weren't born here. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to move through that moment. But now when I go to Denmark, I have an accent in Danish. <laughs> so I don't belong there either. I talked to a friend of mine and I said to her, Alice, you know, I can hear having an accent. I can actually hear my accent in Danish, but I can't hear my accent in English. <laughs> and she said, no, no, you don't. But you could come from a very strange region of the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, belonging. Which, one, re one response to that, is that I'm, I'm obsessed by etymologists. And it so happens, of course, that there are so many r roots, the roots of English and the roots of Danish meet. And when they do, there's that little bubble of wholeness that goes off in me. I don't have to choose between one or the other. They both belong together. And it's a, absolutely amazing when you go to the dictionary and you do that kind of excavation, how many surprises they are, delightful surprises they are. And then I thought, well, that's all right, but that's a very Western point of view, but what if you're a Chinese-American? And then I, I found that this is the only Chinese word I know, and I don't know how to pronounce it, but it cons and I cannot draw it, but it consists of two, the word for poetry consists of two characters uh, in Chinese, word and temple. So when you're writing poetry, you're, you're making, you're building a word temple. And then you go to the Greek word, which is spelled P-O-E-I-N, although I know Latin, I don't know Greek, but maybe somebody does, you can tell me how it's pronounced. No. No Greek scholars here in Asquam? No, I'm a scholar, but I'm a Greek. <laughs> how would you pronounce it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not sure what you're saying, but the word is... Okay. Yeah, I would have to, you know. But the word means to build or to compose. So there you are. Uh, if I were a Chinese-American immigrant, I could make a connection within myself of word temple and building. So, that's all well and good, but can you ever, if you're an immigrant, come to live in the language as if you have been born into it? So I'm going to take the, the phrase in English, I love you. And 
the Danish phrase for that is ja yeah, elsker dig. Now, if you were in my class, I would say, repeat after me. <laughs> yeah. There you go, welcome to Danish. <laughs> um, that's okay, I don't, I don't need it. Um, so, I think that that can be done. And what does it take? Emerson, in his essay on nature, talks about the need to fasten words to things, and I would say, fasten words to feelings. And now I'm going to be outrageous and go to Wordsworth's definition of poetry, which is the spontaneous overflow of feelings. And there are those moments, I love you, where you give yourself over, you surrender an old self, because the only way that that feeling that you now have, living in the language that you now do, can be filled is the, that way. Now, I didn't have peanut butter before I was 20 and came here. <laughs> so peanut butter and jelly sandwiches do not have the same weight, if you will, for me as I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but it can, I think that you can come to feel if you give yourself over to the language and you get, if you will, carried away. You can't be done rationally. You can't decide to say, I want to live in English as if I was born to it. But your feelings can carry you there. And that's quite wonderful. Uh, but then, I found to my surprise that language, however much you think you live in it, even your mother tongue, the one you're born with and that seems as instinctive to you as anything can crumble. It happened to me, I was reading a Danish novel and I came across the word spelled A-B-I-L-D-G-A-A-R-D -A -A and it's pronounced Abilgo. And I knew that I knew the word. I knew that I loved the word and I had no idea what it meant. And I went into an absolute panic because I felt like I just completely lost myself and had betrayed my entire past. And then, fortunately, the meaning of apple gore came flooding over it, me it means orchard. And it's apple garth. We go back to the, to the etymology of it. And garth, of course, means you. The garth is also the etymology of, of yard. So apple yard, there I was. I was back with Mayflowers and September's juice. But right now I've I'm, I'm been teaching some Native American literature and we've been reading a book by a writer called Scott Marmaday who was the first Native American writer to win the, the uh, uh, I think it was the Pulitzer Prize oh, the right. National Book Award in 1967 for a novel called Housemaid of Dawn. And he was born into Kiowa, the southwestern U.S. and into English, at the, to, to, but, but both, had both languages. And he says about this about language, in a profound sense our language determines us. It shapes our most fundamental selves. It establishes our identity and confirms our existence, our human being. Without language, we are lost, thrown away. Without names, we cannot truly claim to be. And that was what I took from losing Abigail, that I could lose the whole thing. And it didn't matter what language I was going to live in, English or Danish, language can go. I could not exist. And I thought about this for a while, and I now need my book. <laughs> no? No. Oh, back here. Of course, I could just turn to the courses I took in poetry as an undergraduate, because <laughs> it was actually all there. But that wasn't how I came by it. I came, if you will, out of, and it was a real panic and a deep sense of rootlessness. And then I was teaching a course on ethnic literature for reasons that will, become, that will be obvious to you. And I uh, uh, came across an autobiography of an Italian-American immigrant called Constantin Pannanzio. And he came to this country in, around the turn of the century, 1900. And uh, he's a young man, 
And the first job he has is digging the Boston subway, which was dirty and dangerous. And the first two <coughs> words he learns in English are pick and shovel. <coughs> then he's cheated out of his uh, earnings by the Pedrona and later employer, employers. He uh, is falsely accused of various things, end up in jail. He's almost murdered. And then he's pressed into a labor gang and taken to uh, work in the lumber camps in Maine where every obstacle is put in front of him so that he can't escape. I mean, a real tough immigrant life, the way millions of immigrants mm -hmm. had to live it. And then he ends up at a farm where the farmer and his mother begin to treat him decently, humanely. And he goes with them to a Sunday service in a small Baptist church in the Maine woods. And this is what happens. Three of us went together, farmer, mother, and we seated ourselves in the back seats, which later I learned evangelist preachers call sinner seats. <laughs> Familiar to anybody? <laughs> no? Part of American life in the 19th century, big time. <laughs> I listened to the songs and the preaching, though I could not understand what the preacher was saying, nor the meaning of the songs. I listened to the songs and the preaching, though I could not understand what the preacher was saying or the meaning of the songs. But during the meeting, something strange gripped the very soul of me. What really happened, I cannot tell, but something very real and powerful was transpiring in my consciousness. Although neither that experience nor any subsequent one made me very religious in the strictly Puritan sense of the word, yet for the first time I thought of life in terms of service. What relation the experience of the preceding months had to the condition which made me susceptible to the influence of this atmosphere, I cannot say. It is exceedingly difficult from the human point of view to explain such occurrences. But there it was. I could not understand what the preacher was saying, nor the meaning of the songs, but something strangely gripped his soul, and he who had been so exploited does not seek revenge. He does not decide to screw the people back who have screwed him, but go 180 degrees and devote his life to service, which he did, became very you know, eminent preacher um, of the whole thing. Great, great success. But there was my answer to what I had been looking for, that below the language lies another language, lies a deep communication. And that's the one that I want to talk a little bit about. It's the, the one, of course, that then all the poetry that I've been taught, uh, analyzed and so on, came back to me within this context. And it becomes what Whitman talks about in uh, leaves of grass, where it says that it's the word unsaid, which swings on something more than the earth. And the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke talks about it as the unsayable. And the poet goes to the mountain and brings back a blue and yellow flower from the pure word. It's unsayable what's brought back, but it's communicated. So, it, it turns into a kind of communion. I don't, I'm not an expert in world literature, but it's, I think it's so interesting that this is very much part of American literature. So Emerson said elsewhere, he says, the world is the projection of God in the, in the unconscious. Well, if that's the case, then it becomes the task of the writer, the poet, to bring that unconsciousness to life. And that's what Emerson does, even in his essays. Well, let me give you a quick example from the essay called Self-Reliance. I think it is from Self-Reliance. He said, if you want to pray, go into your closet and close the door. Period. God will not reveal himself to cower. Period. Now you get that in the freshman writing essay and you say, transition is missing. <laughs> how, do we, how, do we get, how do we get from closing the closet door to cowards? And what Emerson has left is the opportunity for the reader to let the feelings that come with being alone with the divine well up. Fear, terror, awe. <coughs> so, 
And it's, <coughs> if you go to the first edition of Leaves the Grass, Whitman has ellipses, tremendous use of ellipses. And if you stop and no, just don't rush by them, you will know that your heart is beating and you're, you're breathing in a way that you may not have realized for the first time that day. Emerson, uh, Whitman said about Emerson, em I was simmering, simmering, and Emerson brought me to a boil. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it's everywhere. It's the domain of poets primarily, but it, it's also of other writers, <coughs> and indeed I would say of all those who know and seek transcendence. This is what Hawthorne has to say about that language that lies below the surface. He's talking about Dimsdale in the Scarlet Letter mm -hmm. and Dimsdale's sense of sin. He says, it's not that you have to have a conviction of sin in order to speak in this, in order to communicate in this language. This very burden it was that gave him sympathy so intimate with the sinful brotherhood of mankind so that his heart vibrated in unison with theirs and received their pain into itself and sent its own throb of pain through a thousand other hearts in gushes of sad persuasive eloquence. The gift that descended upon Dimsdale was the one, like the one that descended upon the chosen disciples at Pentecost in tongues of flame, symbolizing, it would seem, not the power of speech in foreign and unknown languages, but that of addressing the whole human brotherhood in the heart's native language. So the eloquence that lays creates the conditions for that deeper eloquence, for that deeper, it's where a conversation can turn into communion and it is the one that for me represents the, the high point of my teaching is when the class uh, goes silent because only in the silence can that deep sharing uh, be really, if you will, known. Words will just be an interruption. Doesn't happen very often. Doesn't happen in every course, but it does happen. There's nothing I can wish for as a teacher more than that. Now, here's a passage from the 1630s preached in Boston, down the road. Uh, 1636, and the preacher says, When the Spirit dwelleth in us according to our measure, and we are all one mystical body, I cannot tell how better to compare it than to a musical instrument wherein though there may be pipes, yet one blast of the bellows puts breath into them all, so that all of them at once break forth into a kind of melody and give a pleasant sound to the ears of those that stand by. All of them do make but one instrument and one sound, and yet variety of music. So is this very case. Look at all living members of Christ. They're all compacted <coughs> together and set in one stock and root. By which means it, it comes to pass that though they may be, they may be many thousands, yet they all make a melodious harmony, uh, uh, I'm sorry, harmony in the ears of the Lord of hosts. Therefore the combining of us into the unity of one spirit, necessary it is that the same spirit that breathes in the human nature of Christ should breathe in us all. So that what Leitus talks about, that what happens is it doesn't become just an, aggreg an aggregate of individuals, but something happens that turns a group into one body. Faulkner has a wonderful description of it in the Easter section of The Sound and the Fury. Mm -hmm. what, what, what happens in, it's, it's in, a, in, a, in, a, in a black church. And there's one, one place in modern life which where it's a direct which is the direct descendant of the Puritans where this language is also spoken and spoken now uh, by millions of people in dozens of countries and it's in Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is a direct descendant of the Puritans. It was started in 1935 by two guys all American names, <coughs> uh, Billy Smith and Bob Wilson, <laughs> in Akron, Ohio. And they decided that the appeal to 
willpower to pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, which is a hard thing to do if you're standing in your boots. <laughs> <laughs> um, that wasn't going to work. And that the very opposite of that was what was called for, namely an acknowledgement that they could not, if you will, do it by their own willpower, but they had to turn to another, to another power. And um, so it becomes to, to God as that is defined by the individual. Now, if you were a Puritan alcoholic, <laughs> they did exist, uh, you would turn to uh, the non-separating Puritan, Anglican, Protestant, Christian, believed in the Trinity, but in AA, they have taken the central idea of the self-surrender and said, you surrender to a power as you define it, as it, what it means to you. And in so doing, the major person that they turned to, they turned to the Oxford movement, they turned to Carl Jung, but the major person was William James. Mm. And William James's uh, study uh, with Jonathan Edwards is a treatise on religious affection is the great religious psychological classic in America, namely the varieties of religious experience. And this is what um, James says about the self-surrender, which is the central passage in the varieties of religious experience. When the will has done its uttermost towards bringing one close to the complete unification aspired after, it seems that the very last step must be left to other forces and performed without the help of its activity. In other words, self-surrender becomes then indispensable. We have used the, we meaning James, have used the vague and abstract language of psychology, but since in any terms the crisis described is the throwing of our conscious selves upon the mercy of powers which, whatever they may be, are more ideal than we are actually, and make for our redemption, you see by self-surrender has been and always must be regarded as vital turning point of the religious life so far as the religious life is spiritual and no affair of auto works, ritual, and sacraments. So, uh, there are other things that, that AA took from the Puritans, such as um, in the Puritans, you were required, if you wanted to be a church member, to stand up and describe your religious experience. In AA, you are free to not do it, but you also, there's, the group is also open to people talking about themselves. And there's another group, which is the Quakers. One of my children has become a Quaker, and when I visit him, I go to a meeting. And there's some those moments in the silence where all of a sudden something happens and we're no longer a hundred people sitting in a room with one group. And you come out of it again. Something very profound, the language of Canaan, the heart's native language, is being communicated. Now, that language, if you will, depends on a chemical, a peptide tide called oxytocin. Now, let me say it again. I'll come back to oxytocin in a minute. But that AA also represents to me a, a, the, the, the great idea of a radical democracy. Mm -hmm. Namely that it cannot be corrupted by money. I mean, think for a minute, mm -hmm. if members of Congress at the prayer meetings did what what members of AA do when they, if members of AA stand up and say, I cannot not take a drink, and that becomes, I cannot take a drink. Now, what if members of Congress at their prayer breakfast said, I cannot take the money, and change it to, I cannot take the money. dollar for coffee. And, and in the face, but it is a radical democracy in the sense that they're just as it was for the Puritans, that those people who uh, are reborn, are reborn, so regardless of their social status, regardless of money or family or anything else, it is simply they have surrendered 
themselves and, and be been reborn. Yeah. So is it that in AA, it doesn't matter who you are. And in that way, it seems to me to hold, and that the fact that it is started here in this country makes me terribly proud, and that it's now being used, or that there are millions of members all over the world and in dozens of countries. <coughs> it is one of the, the best things that we have done for, for the world, if you will. Maybe we have to give up <coughs> the very idea of doing something for the world. But in any case, the, the peptide, the oxytocin, that turns out to be alive in, in uh, meetings of AA, is the same one that exists between mother and child, mother and infant. And uh, it turns out that it is the peptide that is deeply connected to love and trust. And I just, there was a little notice in the Boston Globe last Sunday that they now find, found that oxytocin is also uh, linked to gratitude. And so we had this wonderful paradox that the deepest language that we have, or the deepest communion that we have, is unsayable. It is our first mother tongue. It's evanescent. It gives life and then disappears. It's a tongue of flame. And it brings us into communion with each other in love and trust and gratitude. Thank you. So I, I thought John said to have a conversation. I'm good to answer any question you may have. But I thought it might be also interesting for us if you could begin to share. Oh, Maybe you already do, but tonight, what it means for you to be living in Anspon. Over here. I would, I'd like to begin as uh, Anaskwam's irrepressible laureate. <laughs> <laughs> Just say how, how much we love you, Jesper. <laughs> what a lovely form of Vespers that tonight we get to listen to Yesmus. Take on all things Puritanic. As employing his scholarship Titanic, he's alerted us to historical dramas playing out here for us Anasquamas. <laughs> so here's to early American lit and to how pleased we are to have Jesper sit in our midst, teasing us with why we still live in a past that has not passed us by, yeah. and still is calling to us to find an eros that unifies heart and mind, and tells us explicitly we must go along with a longing stronger than lust. Thank you, dear Jesper, for explaining the demand at hand in the land of Canaan <laughs> and for making tonight available things not only unsaid, but unsayable. <laughs> <laughs>